Hello and welcome to The Spectator's Alternative Conference, sponsored by Barclays. With this autumn's political conferences moving online, The Spectator has brought together politicians, academics, think tanks and members of the public to discuss a year that's fundamentally changed Britain and where we go from here. For the next three days, Spectator TV will be hosting over 20 panels, in-conversation events and live podcasts with topics ranging from healthcare to the labour market, from trade to technology, our future relationship with the EU, and of course, the effects of COVID on virtually every aspect of our lives. Today's line off kicks off with a morning of economics, kindly sponsored by Barclays, and the spectators, Kate Andrews, will be chairing a panel on the economic recovery from COVID-19, featuring the financial secretary to the treasury, Jesse Norgan. Then Katie Bowles will host a panel on the future of British trade and globalization with Liz Truss. This afternoon, we've got a panel on the NHS and COVID sponsored by MSD and featuring Simon Stevens, the chief executive of the NHS. We'll discuss the Green Revolution sponsored by Drax with the Conservative MP and former business advisor to the Prime Minister, Andrew Griffith. And to cap things off, I'll be speaking to my former colleague, now the Equalities Minister, Kemi Badenich, about the Conservatives' equalities agenda and how to handle the culture wars. Now, in between these panels, we're going to have a special live podcast from our Coronomics series and several panels hosted by some of Britain's leading think tanks. Now, you, the audience watching this, you, you'll be able to submit questions to us during each panel and put your thoughts and ideas to Britain's leading politicians and thinkers. As said, you can watch all of these sessions for free today simply by going to tv.spectator.co.uk. But before we turn to the public policy debates, let's get a political update from The Spectator's deputy political editor, Katie Balls. So Katie, here we are gathered in London, not sure the city is going to be locked down by the time we leave it today. Um, over the road in Parliament, the Conservatives look like having a rebellion on their hands with the renewal of the Coronavirus Act as it stands now. So what can we expect and how difficult could things get for the government? Yeah. Um, it's becoming a rather regular refrain, which is, it's looking like it's going to be a tricky week for Boris Johnson. Um, I don't know when that hasn't been the case for a while, but uh, you mentioned a few of the things coming up the track. You saw the front page of the Times today talking about what effectively sounds like a circuit break, the idea that Boris Johnson's previously dismissed at least in the short term so almost a social lockdown where you can't see your friends people outside your other household you can't really go out for dinner but you can go to school and you can probably go to work if you really have to otherwise work from home um, I think in terms of when we might expect to see these changes there's always been a sense in government that you need to give uh, all these changes such as the rule of six things like that about two weeks to get to see the effect it's having, if it's meaning the rates are changing. So really, we wouldn't actually expect to have anything that drastic this week. However, it's very clear that there is concern in number 10 about the direction the numbers are going in. And specifically on London, you have the London Mayor, Sadiq Khan, who's pushing for tougher restrictions and has been for some time. So while I don't think it's a dead set, I think that's why we might get something ahead of this idea of a review in three weeks, which is probably what we hear more about if you're looking at, at I suppose, precedent. And then I think if we go to the House of Commons, Boris Johnson has a real problem on his hands for his own MPs. We heard from Graham Bray last week on Spectator TV the week uh, in 60 Minutes and ultimately there is a rebellion coming up the track. At the moment it seems that Boris Johnson is on course for a Commons defeat however he could be saved because the Speaker may not pick the amendment but this is all about number 10 and the government's ability to make decisions on coronavirus without consulting MPs. A block of MPs this is Tory MPs and some Labour want the Commons to have more powers. And the question is, do they get the chance to have that this week? Or is that round that tension going to continue for weeks to come? Right. So you're saying the Speaker might not actually call the amendment. Now, that's a bit strange, given that the amendment is one fairly crucial to our democracy, which is whether the government is allowed to keep on passing laws without Parliament's approval. Parliament gave its approval relatively, uh, well, at the beginning of the pandemic, in what was genuinely an emergency. Now things are moving at a far more normal um, rate. People are having debates in parliaments all over Europe. So why, why do we think this wouldn't be chosen now? 
Yeah, I think, uh, well, as you just say, a lot of MPs feel as though we've moved past the emergency stage of coronavirus. So why are there emergency powers? If, as the Chancellor seemed to suggest last week, we are now living with coronavirus, the economy has to change as a result. Is that a prolonged year-long emergency? Or is this actually the new normal? Sorry, sorry to use that dreaded phrase. Um, I think part of the reason for this, though, is uh, when it comes to the amendment, there are questions over its legal force, um, where it even passes, why Lindsay Hoyle may not select it. Um, so I think it comes down to ultimately uh, Commons procedures, um, so much as you know, his personal liking for coronavirus. Right. Uh, so, but right now, if, if, if this amendment passes, then we can expect, not quite back to the Brexit days, but every single thing the government does will be debated. I guess the idea of the rebels is that that will put the, that will put um, that will put the policies back up to public scrutiny. That rather than have um, Messrs Whitty and Valance come over to present slides for us, they will be able to make a better, stronger case. So the argument of the rebels is that they're actually helping the government by improving the quality of decision making because sunlight is the best disinfectant. So it might get rid of some of the um, wrong assumptions because we have seen, for example, the government um, use hospital data categorizing as a COVID death, something that turns out not to have been a COVID death. That's the sort of thing that's got them worried. It's not so much, of a, is that right? It's not, uh, is it the case that they're not so much, we're not worried about the direction of policy, just that right now you might get errors creeping in simply because the parliamentary scrutiny filter has been switched off? Yeah, well, I mean, I think these MPs believe they're being helpful. I'm not sure number 10 thinks they're being particularly helpful. Um, the chief whip is going to be meeting with some today to try and get them to change course, also offer assurances. But I think ultimately there are a few things. As you say, there is a sense amongst some Tory MPs that because there is not a proper debate going on, um, you have uh, written about Fraser as black box, you know, diplomacy in a way. Um, that means that things do fall through the cracks. You have mistakes, things that if you actually had a parliamentary debate, it's not necessary that Steve Baker would be able to go through all the data, but it would mean that more people were in the conversation and listening and things to be flagged. If you look at the MPs backing the Brady Amendment, what's quite striking is these aren't just lockdown sceptics on the libertarian wing of the party. Uh, you have many One Nation Tories like Damien Green. Now, I don't think all these people backing this amendment would agree on the next steps in coronavirus. Some would want tighter restrictions, some would want few restrictions. But what they all agree on is that right now having a very small body of people making the decisions is not healthy. Um, just finally, I think if you're looking at the various restrictions, if this does get selected and then goes through, number 10 can't get these MPs to walk back. And all the signs are that Keir Starmer's Labour would probably go with this if their own amendment doesn't pass. It is going to be interesting because we have a situation where when we're talking about things like a circuit break, I think that there is limited appetite on the Tory backbenches for anything that comes close to a national lockdown. And when you're talking about a circuit break, which is effectively a minimum of two weeks of a lot of businesses that are just starting to get back on their feet closing, I think you could get strong opposition. Now, Tory MPs might be opposed, some Tory MPs will support it, but then that goes over to Labour almost to say, well, Keir Starmer, you have to actually start taking very active positions on all of this. Now, some of the things we're going to be discussing in the Spectator Conference this week is what was referred to in the old days as politics. Right now, it's been COVID, COVID, COVID. Uh, I guess uh, one of the things that the, the, the rebels are arguing is that politics does need to go back in normal. There are really important questions about the economy, about energy, even about environmental regulation, that if you delay these conversations, it will be to the detriment of the country. So is that part of the argument that, that basically they're, they're pushing for the government to stop being basically a COVID only response, they're pushing for the NHS to be effectively a, the national COVID service and to push us back towards the kind of topics we're just going to be discussing today? Yeah, I, I think there is part of it. And I think there is a sense that if you look back to a few months ago, so in the spring when we were in that intense period, there was no one in government working on anything but coronavirus. If as someone in number 10 said to me at the time, when I asked, you know, what else is going on? Um, you know, if anyone is working on something else, they're doing something wrong. There is a sense that this government has to focus on other things now. But also what these Tory MPs are quite worried about is that we have a situation 
situation where the Chancellor is obviously foreseeing a change in the economy to adapt to living with coronavirus. Now that means that all of a sudden there are big policy decisions which coronavirus is influencing, which go into domestic policy areas, things that we're going to be talking about at this conference. And I think they want to be part of that conversation because if you're talking about what's going to prosper in the post-coronavirus age or even the living with coronavirus age, that is not just an emergency decision. I think that's a decision where lots of uh, conservative values, or, you know, there's a debate that needs to be had. And I think that's one of the big things driving this. Can we talk a bit about the relationship between the Treasury and Number 10? Now, the whole point of Rishi Sunak becoming Chancellor was that Saja Javid was saying, look, I, this is an outrageous um, affront to my independence as Chancellor because Boris Johnson wanted to have teams split between the, chan- the Treasury and Number 10. Now, the idea is that Rishi Sunak was supposed to be far more on board with Boris Johnson than, than Saja Javid was. But already, if you pick up the papers, you're beginning to see um, Rishi Sunak portrayed anyway as not quite being um, lockdown skeptic, but far more on that wing than number 10. We hear, for example, that it's normally Rishi Sunak's voice, which is persuading the prime minister to hold off, not to implement the full lockdown measures, which is um, SAGE committee advisors are asking him. So in the next session, when we get um, Jesse Norman, the financial secretary of treasury, discussing the, can we expect from him a sort of a more focus on the broader aspects of the economy. I mean, can we see tension growing, in other words, between number 10 and number 11? So I'm not sure if it's tension yet, but uh, I don't think it has been unnoticed that if you pick up the papers, they tend to be quite negative about Boris Johnson and quite positive about Rishi Sunak. And I think that when you speak to Tory MPs, um, bar the odd one, um, they tend to have more praise for Rishi Sunak than Boris Johnson. There is a sense that the Treasury has been the one blocking a lot of the more restrictive measures that have been pondered. And I think that I've had Tory MPs say to me, you know, on Friday, that that if Rishi Sunak was making the main decisions on coronavirus, things would look very different. We would not be heading to this, you know, uh, mini semi lockdown type of arrangement. So I think that also, if you look at Rishi Sunak's phrases last week when he talked about, you know, living without fear, it definitely seemed to be a different script to what Boris Johnson was talking about. So I think that they do seem now, I think we're seeing more differences. I think they have been exacerbated. It's clear that the Chancellor is always going to be focused on the economy and that probably does lean you to one side of this debate. But I think that this idea that you are going to, I remember when Rishi Sunak was first announced as Sajid Javid's um, successor and everyone said he's going to be baby Chino, so baby Chancellor in name only. And that has completely not proved to be the case. And this joint number 10, number 11 unit, where you have special advisors working um, both for number 10 and for the Treasury, and importantly, approved by number 10. Actually, they're all very loyal to Rishi, and there is still a strong sense that there is a a Rishi Sunak team and a Boris Johnson team. Though, just to slightly kill the Rishi mania before I finish, there was one... um, over the Tory MP WhatsApp thread over the last week when they were putting out all these snazzy graphics that Rishi Sunak uses. There was one uh, government minister, Johnny Mercer, he replied saying, you know, I do want to share this, but can I have one that doesn't have just Rishi's signature? I'd like to have conservative branding. So not everyone is there to share. Katie, thanks very much indeed. Well, let's go straight on from that to our first session of the Spectators virtual conference today. We're hosted by my colleague Kate Andrews with Jesse Norman to discuss the recovery. Thank you, Katie.